Well, let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. This particular message is one that makes me think a lot. There's a lot of things here, and even as I'm sitting there, there's things going through my mind, and I'm thinking about other things as well. But let's go ahead and stand this morning as we read the scriptures and go before the Lord. And I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11, Acts chapter 15. And the Bible says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem Upon the, uh, unto the apostles and the elders about the question. In being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenis and Samaria, and declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church, and of the apostles and elders, And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts, by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall all be saved, even as they. This morning, the title of my message is Legalism. Legalism. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I just thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you this morning and, and for the choir special we had today and the thought that perhaps there are millions out there that have not heard the gospel and we do not love them because we do not tell them the gospel. Lord God, I pray that you would give us the zeal of those that were in the early church during this time period who desired to see people saved with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us not to be deterred by people who will be zealous for things that they've been influenced by in their lives, yet apart from the Word of God. Instead, Lord, help us to be zealous for your Word and for the teaching of it. God, I pray that you would use me as your servant here this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, what's interesting to me, and when we look at legalism, and you've probably heard the term legalistic, legalism, in churches. This is legalism. What we see in this context right here is the biblical concept of what legalism is. There's a lot of confusion among people today, Uh, but when people are taught, as these people were taught at Antioch, when people are taught that you have to do something or you have to keep the law 
in order to be saved, that's legalism. We are not saved by what we do. Paul teaches that if we are saved by grace, then it is not of works. If we are saved of works, then it is not of grace. It's either one or the other. Now, some people have taken the idea of not being legalistic to the point where they decided that they don't think we should have any rules. We don't want to be legalists. We don't want to make rules and enforce things on people. One commentator says that this is spiritual anarchy. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting. But this is not true. That's not what the Bible is saying at all. And some have taken the idea that we don't want to be legalists, so we don't want to judge anybody. We don't want to judge sin. We don't want to say this is right or this is wrong. We, we just want to tell people about the love of God. Not only is this false, it's dangerous. And it's completely contrary to the word of God. First of all, in order to be saved, I think you need to realize that you're lost. Many people that I have dealt with on salvation, the biggest issue that they've had when I've got right down to it is that they don't understand that they are a lost sinner that needs to be saved. If you've never come to that place in your life when you realize, I'm lost, I need to be saved, then you're not saved. You can't get saved when you've never realized you're lost. I had that experience in my life. I, you know, I was going to church, and I enjoyed the church. I remember coming to this church back in 1977. I think we started coming in on the bus route somewhere around January of 77. Uh, and as I was coming, and at first we were kind of hit and miss, and then we started becoming regular, and so I was coming for a few months. But I didn't get saved until the end of May. And I enjoyed the church. I listened to the preaching of the word. I listened to the pastor. I was just really interested in the fact that the church people brought their Bibles. That was something I hadn't seen. And also, there was a, a relationship between the church. You know, I went to church before that. We'd usher in. Boom, 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 boom. We'd sit down. We leave. And you might see somebody say, oh, hey, Joe, how's it going? I saw you. You know, but other than that, very little talking went on. You know, you just kind of went in, you went out. But this church had friendship. They had a relationship. They had fellowship. They were talking to one another. They stood up. They sang the songs. They read the Bible. They listened to what was going on. It seemed like it was having an effect on them. You know what I'm saying? It seemed like church was doing something to them from my perspective at that time. And I thought to myself, this is something I've never had before, but it's something I think I'd like to have. People were friendly to me. Teenagers were friendly to me. I never had teenagers befriend me before. People wanted me to sit with them. I never had people want me to come sit with them. You know, it was completely different, and it's the way it ought to be. But then I started listening to the message. All of that was about the church. All of that was the, the effect. All of that was the testimony. But it wasn't about salvation, and it wasn't about faith, and it wasn't about my personal identification. I started going, I started realizing that there needed to be a change in me, and probably even some things changed in my life. I started to adopt probably some of the values that were going that I was seeing in church and some of the attitude when I got there and being friendly myself. But then I was listening to the preacher preach. He was talking about the wages of sin is death. And, I, and somebody came up to me, uh, another teenager, Dave Pierce, some of you know him, leaned over to me and said, would you like to go forward and get saved? And I was like, most teenagers, oh, that's okay. I don't want to do that. But that week, what struck me was the realization that without Christ, I was going to go to hell. And that in order to be lost, all I had to do, and this I think was with the point of the verse as well as the message, is commit one sin. Now the idea of a 15-year-old teenager trying to think of one sin he committed is laughable. 
I, I couldn't keep it down to 100, I don't think, <laughs> let alone one. I mean, it was very easy to think of one. I committed sins all the time. I knew I was a sinner, so this gripped my heart. And I said, I'm going to go to hell. I'm, I'm lost. I need a Savior. And the next week, I went forward, and I called upon him. So I'm not picking on anybody today. I'm sharing with you my experience and understanding. And I'm telling you, if you don't realize you're lost, you can't get saved. Salvation is not something you do in order to be saved. It's putting your faith in Christ and in what he did. And in order to understand and put your faith in Christ, you must realize that he did it in order to save you. And without that, you would be completely lost. Now, here's the thing. The idea that some would say, well, we don't want to judge anybody. You know... One of the problems with not judging people and not judging people according to the Word of God is that, number one, it keeps people in the bondage of sin. Judgment is not meant to be mean-spirited or ugly. If you're judging people and you have an ugly spirit about your judgment towards them, then you're the problem. And that's what is addressed in Matthew chapter 7. If you're judging people and recognizing a spiritual need and you're doing something about it, whether it is winning them to the loss or encouraging them and helping them because you know that sin is bondage, then there is hope for them. Because you understand that if somebody is in sin, they are in bondage. And that sin is always destructive. And you understand that because you love them and because you see their need and because you don't want them to be in bondage anymore, you want them to be liberated. You go to them with an appeal in your heart. Please repent or turn to God or whatever the need is because you are in bondage and there is hope. You don't have to be. That's the truth. Now, I'm going to look back in Matthew chapter 7 just for a moment, but I'm going to continue here in Acts 15. If you want to look back, you can look back with me. Matthew chapter 7. What he is addressing in Matthew chapter 7 is not judgment, per se. It's a particular kind of judgment. It's hypocrisy. And I'll show you that. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. He's not telling you not to judge. He's telling you that you're going to be held. If you're going to judge hypocritically, who's he talking to here? Well, he addresses them. Let me continue. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite. Who's he talking to? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. If we don't tell people they're lost, they'll never get saved. If we don't tell people that they're in bondage, they'll never be free. If we don't, tell pe if we don't address sin in the church, the church has a poor testimony of Christ. It is essential that we have judgment, but not hypocritical judgment. What's he telling us here? Judgment begins with you. Judgment begins with you. You know, I, I sat there sometimes. I was talking to somebody recently. And we were talking about this guy and that guy. We, I had a missionary who came by, and a nice man. We took him out to lunch just last week. And he came by and shared a testimony in, in church. And we were talking about, in, in uh, uh, Sunday school, in our chapel downstairs. And we were talking about things, and, and I said to him, 
you know, here's the thing. I said, you, you talk about these guys that are running three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 people. I mean, who am I? <laughs> to think about what they're doing and why they're doing it. You know? Not that I don't have an opinion, mind you, but I, I have to be cautious. God does not say never to judge. In fact, God holds us accountable to judge. He holds us accountable to judge one another. John chapter 7 and verse 24 says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's what Jesus said there, too. He told them to judge. Not according to appearance, though. Not hypocritically, but righteous judges. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15 says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? Matthew chapter 7. He's not doing it with hypocrisy. He starts off in his own life. His motivation is love. His motivation is liberty. You know, we have an addictions program that we, we go through. We're not doing it right now, but we went through it in the spring. And, and uh, in the fall, I should say. And we had some folks that came in and they had some bad addictions in their life and their life was a wreck. And I, you know, you want to just grab them right away and, and try to, but you realize there's some decisions that they have to make themselves. There's things that they have to do in order to recognize that they are in bondage and that drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, uh, whether it's something immoral that has that overtaken their life that they have become a slave to, is destroying them. And you want them to be free. You want them to know that they can be liberated from that sin and that bondage. And you want them to know that you have an answer, and that answer is Christ. You want them to know all these things. But you have to identify that this is sin, and it's destructive, and it's in bondage. When there's churches out there that say there's nothing wrong with doing this or doing that, and, and, and yet they, they have these people that are in bondage to these things, there's something wrong because it's destroying lives, and God's people need to say, well, then I need to judge myself with righteous judgment. What's righteous judgment? Righteous judgment's according to the Word of God. I can look at these two boys right here. Stand up here. Come here. They're worried now. They already got to talking to me once today, so they're a little concerned. <laughs> Come here. Come here. You're not in trouble now. Come here. <laughs> and I can say, I'm tall. I'm a tall man. I'm a big tall man. And I'm strong. Look at that. Can you do that? No. <laughs> That's not righteous judgment. Now, if I get the two hens over here, Daniel and his dad, Daniel's downstairs at the Congenia Church, even, even Daniel's probably my height. He probably my weight, too. <laughs> He's a big boy. I, I brought, you can sit down now. I brought my kids in. We had the three Carney boys get physicals this last week. That was wild. Three of us, three, three of them with me inside that little physical room. Whew. Anyways, TJ, you know, he gets on the scale, and I'm like, man, he's catching up to me. And so I got to, you know. <laughs> They're getting big. You know, compared to others, that's a ridiculous statement to think that I, to be full of myself, but that's what we do. We compare ourselves to other people. We say, well, according to other people out there, I'm saved. According to other people out there, I'm good. According to other people out there, I'm wise. According to other people out there, I'm kind. But that's not righteous judgment. That's prejudice judgment. Because we look at everybody else and we decide according to them. But righteous judgment is done. According to the Bible, Paul said we are not wise when we compare ourselves among ourselves. See, here is legalism. Some people will have the idea, well, 
you know, I've had people my whole life, as long as I've been a Christian, I've been either in this church, from this church, or associated with Pastor Turner and out of his church in, in Florida as a missionary. People always knew. They knew Pastor Turner. They knew his stand doctrinally and, 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 and conservatively and so forth. But there was always people out there that wanted to label you legalists because you had standards. Because you wanted God's people to live a holy life. Do you know why God wants you to live a holy life? Because you can. Because you can. You have the liberty to live for Christ. You don't have to yield yourself in bondage. And not wholly according to what somebody says over here or somebody says over there or what this person thinks acceptable or that person thinks acceptable or to be in bondage to culture of our times or culture of the past even. But according to the Word of God, what we all want to do, Ephesians tells us we all want to grow up into Christ. We want to be more like Christ. Is that not loving? To be more like Christ? My kids sometimes imitate me in little ways. Somebody was recently saying that how, oh, it was Brother Jolt. He, he was saying how Katie's already picked up some of my little carnyisms, I guess. <laughs> My little metaphors, my little illustrations, the little things that hang on the end of my sentences and so forth. And she's already spit. But see, that's, to me, when my children want to be like me, that's love. It means they love me. How does God feel? Well, thank you, Christ, for dying on the cross for me. And I appreciate it. I really do. I love you for all you've done. But don't expect me to have to be like you. But I love you, God. And don't let that preacher tell me either. I'll tell you right now, because I'm sick and tired of people judging me. Legalists. Is that what it's supposed to be? Let me tell you something. The best thing you can do in your life is be more like Christ. You will never have more joy in your life, more peace in your life, more hope in your life, more contentment, more guidance. More, you know, in every area, the more you are like Christ, the happier and the more joy you will have in your heart. Amen. And I want that for every believer in our church. I don't accept anybody being away from Christ. I don't accept anybody uh, imitating the world or following the world or being like the world or emulating the world. I want them all to know that that is what Christ has liberated us from so that we could be like him. The world cannot be like Christ. We can. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts, and your ignorance. So you didn't know about it. You didn't know the word of God. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That's what God wants. He wants us to live a life unto him. So here's one of the things. Here's a couple of interesting quotes I came across. This, this is not something new. You say, well, is this a contemporary thing? Isn't this something that's just come up in the last, the last 10 years or so? No, not at all. In fact, this is a little bit old, but not too old. This comes from 1992. Legalism is when one thinks he must be, do something or keep the law in order to be saved. We might just insert a brief commentary on the thought of legalism. Legalism is the Bible is an attempt to keep the law to gain salvation. Legalism in the Bible is an attempt to keep the law from salvation. There are those today that relate legalism to many other thoughts. Biblically, 
Legalism is keeping the law for salvation. That's from Derrickson, 1992. Arthur Pink, of course, he's in the 1800s, that sinners become saints by obeying the law. This is legalism, pure and simple. Spurgeon, salvation by works is pure legalism. The same thing, you can go to Vincent, Edersheim, Strong, Tory, Robertson, all the guys that you have commentaries that you get free, you see them in your little things. But this, I really like. This is a sermon from Spurgeon. He says, the tendency to legalism, which is natural to us, kicks against the glorious doctrine of free grace and unchanging love. And sometimes we say, I am afraid that I am not good enough to pray or fit to participate in the grace of God. As if God wanted some good in us before we would bestow his grace upon us. A diseased man is fit to be healed. A poor man is fit for alms. A drowning man is fit to be rescued. A sinful man is fit to be forgiven. I think we can see the testimony of what he's talking about here. We want people to be saved. We want people to be forgiven. We don't want people to think it's totally fine and it's okay. People that are drowning need someone to rescue them. Listen, we got a world out there that's drowning in sin. I just saw there's these two young rappers that are on there on television, and I saw on the, on the news channel the other day. It was only up there for a few minutes, so probably a lot of people didn't see it. But they, was, they were kids. They were rappers, so they were like 10 years old or 11 years old, young. I don't know how old they were. They little, didn't look much young, older than these two boys right here, but they had a rap song that was popular years ago. And now one of them just turned 32 or something like that, and, and uh, he died of a drug overdose. You know, haven't heard from him in years, of course. You know, that's where that life led him. I remember someone that came to our church and used to pick up a young person who was uh, only, you know, like 12 years old or something like that. He used to pick him up. He lived over here in Brockton. Picked up the kid and brought him in there. And the kid came and came to church and had these two little girls hanging around him everywhere he went. And He'd sit there in the car with his arm around these two little girls, and he came in. He came out to church one day like that. Came out and heard the gospel. He's dead now. <coughs> He's dead. Yep. Uh, he had sin for a season. Now, maybe somebody would sit there and say, well, <laughs> I want to press him. This is his culture. This is, this is the way he lives. This is, this is the way he earns money. This is what's killing him. This is what's robbing him of the life that he could have in Christ. This is what's destroying the life he could have if he turned his heart to God. This is keeping him from the love of God in his life. And now, unless he responded at some point in his life to that gospel before he heard the message, he's in hell today, forever. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with telling people you can be saved. And there's everything right with telling people this is what the Bible teaches us about ourselves. Because I know God. And I happen to have faith and confidence that God loves us enough to tell us what we need because it's because of his love. And I've seen enough people destroyed in their lives to know that we should never skip over sin we should never skip over lust. We should never skip over anything that will keep us in bondage and keep us away from God. Look at what he says here. Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. That, in verse number 24, he says, For as much as ye have heard that, contain, that certain which came, went out from us, having troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Do you know what I picture happening here? Because look in verse number 2. And I don't think it takes too much to read this in there. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation. They argued with them. They fought with them. It got hated. They sat there and they said, well... 
Peter said, John said, when I was there, I heard Luke, and Luke was saying, and then I heard this guy over there, these guys, they're writing books, come on, who are you? That's what they were doing. So Paul and Barnabas in the church in Antioch said, well, let's go talk to them. Let's go find out what they said. When they get there, they find out, uh, pff, we never sent these guys, and we never said that. But let's think about it. Let's think about what you are responsible to do out of the Old Testament. It hasn't come up yet in our little church. It's only been around for a little while. And they looked at that, and they decided that they shouldn't eat things strangled or things uh, that they shouldn't eat blood. But other than that, they said, keep the grace of God. But those weren't things to be saved. Those are things they suggested they shouldn't do because it was, it was things that would be bad for them. <laughs> but here's the thing. They stood up for it. They knew it's not what the Bible says. There's a lot of good things in this passage of Scripture. They stood up for the Word of God. You know, sometimes I've been stood up, I've stood up for the Word of God, and the very people that I thought should be praising me or patting me on the back or saying amen for standing up for the Word of God were the very people that turned around and shot at me. But these men stood up for the Word of God and followed it to its conclusion. Look at what, look at what it says here in verse number uh, 3. In being brought on their way by the church. You know what that's talking about? When they were brought on their way by church, how does the church bring them on their way? The church financed it. <laughs> that's what we do with our missionaries today. They come in, we give them a love offering, and we send them on their way. That's why I say today it's, you know, the idea of a missionary coming by and giving them $75 or $100 is unless he's local. And he's just coming by, like I had the guy come by for chapel. I gave him lunch and a small check. I didn't give him a big offering. But he's a local guy. He was here locally. I just invited him. I wanted to talk to him about what he believed. I always do that. But if we're going to have somebody come, we need to send them on their way. Just take care of their needs. And that's getting rather expensive these days. He goes on and he says, They passed through Phinis and Samaria declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Now, this is what I really like here, the conversion. That is not legalism. That's not legalism, to have conversion. Webster, 1828, says, a turning or change from one state to another. In fact, he goes, this word right here, it's a Greek infinitive that's become a noun. It's kind of like a gerund in our language, but it's a little bit different. It's like saying the ones that have turned from something. That's how he's describing them. That's how he names them. That's what Christianity is supposed to be like, that we are now like Christ. We are followers of Christ. People were called Christians first in Antioch. Why were they called Christians? Because the world called them Christians. The world called them Christians because they were like Christ. People were saying, we heard about this man, Jesus Christ. We heard all about him. And I'm telling you right now that these people, they act like Jesus. You know who you sound like? You sound like that Jesus guy. You know who you act like? You act like that Jesus guy. What do they call him? Jesus the Christ. That's what you are. You're a follower of Christ. You're a Christian. Some of them were persecuted for it. It wasn't a name of love. Oh, Christian. He's a Christian. It was an accusation. Has anybody ever accused us of being a follower of Christ? You know, I don't know how can you have that happen unless there's a change in your life. How can you have that happen if there's no pressure? Brother Glenn. <laughs> Brother Glenn and I talk about that all the time. Talked about this morning prayer time. How can you have, how can you have a testimony if nothing is different? How can Christ 
have a testimony in your life if he hasn't done anything to you? There's got to be a conversion from one thing to another thing. And this is what the Bible declares. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. David said, he's put a new song in my mouth. Let me tell you, we need a new song. We need a new life. We need a new attitude. We need forgiveness. We need kindness. We, we, need, we need to love. But we need to be a witness and a testimony. And we need to have a desire. And we need to put priorities in our life to begin with things like prayer and the Word of God. We need a conversion. We need to become something we never were before. What were these people converted from? Look over in Acts chapter 26. Acts 26 and verse number 18. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That was Paul's message to the Gentiles. We don't want people to be in the power of darkness any longer. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light. In the Lord, walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. What does that mean, walk as children? Is that like, I'm walking like light, I guess. It's talking about that when you were in the world, you were guided by all the standards and principles and popularity and all the things of the world. And then Christ came into your light and there was a conversion. Your eyes were open. You realized the Word of God. You studied the Word of God and it had an effect upon your life. And things began to change. And you started to realize this is what God says. This is what the Bible says. This is what I must do. And it begins with baptism. When we take on a testimony before the local church and we say, I want to stand up. I want to live a life that is dedicated to the Lord. That says, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I may not know everything, but I know where I'm going to find the answers and I want everybody to know it. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Here's something, those of you that are on my Facebook friends... <laughs> You caught this yesterday. I couldn't help but share this because I thought this was good. I'm not praising myself here, but it's something that came together out of this verse, and I'd just like to share with you. Jesus said in Luke chapter 22 and verse 53, When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour, the power of darkness. See, the, th the, the response to that now is, now is not the hour of the power of darkness in your life. If you have been saved, you are free from sin. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? It's already happened. You are no longer part of the power of darkness. It is not his hour for you. You have a citizenship somewhere else. You are passing through this world, but you are not of this world. 
Don't yield to the devil the hour that God has given you on earth to be a testimony for Jesus Christ. Don't let him steal what you can do for God. Don't let him rob the message that others need to hear. Don't let him stop the prayers that would pour from your lips. You're free. It is not his hour anymore. If you're saved, if you've realized that moment, and, and probably maybe, maybe most of you here, if not all of you, I don't even know. I can't look into people's hearts. Have had that profession in your life. If you haven't, you need to do so. You say, well, I don't know. I don't want anybody to judge me. Don't worry about what other people judge me. You're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said he's going to judge you by this book right here. He's not going to judge you according to other people. You know how legalism has worked its way into churches that have a semblance of the gospel in them? It's worked its way through baptism. You have to have faith in Christ, but you also have to be baptized. It's worked its way in through the idea of losing your eternal security. Oh, you're saved by grace, but now you have to keep that salvation or you're not saved. That's the legalism of our times. And it's just as wrong as what the Jews are trying to say there today. We're saved by faith in Christ alone. But look at what he says here. Let me go on. Let me just read this here. Look down in verse number 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. Christian, is there a battle for your heart today? Is there a problem with the lust of this world? Is there a problem with iniquity that you see everywhere around you? Are you battling things and you say, I just can't control it. It's down in my heart. And when I close my eyes at night, there's a problem there. And I remember these things. And I remember things of the past. What you need to understand is that you are not liberated by you. You are liberated by Jesus Christ. And he has defeated the powers of darkness. You don't have to yield yourself. You don't have to follow the world. You don't have to give yourself over to always feel like you're on the wrong end of the stick. You can't have victory in Christ today. Well, that's a little dis disputation. That's a little bit disputing. Let me tell you something. I'm sick of the devil ruining people's lives. Say, preacher, calm down. I'm sick of it. I'm sick and tired of it. I, I have dealt with people that Pastor Turner dealt with. I dealt with people that years ago, I could talk to the preacher and say, Preacher, guess who I was talking to this last week? He says, who? I says, I was down so-and-so, and I saw so-and-so. He says, how he's doing today? Oh, he's on drugs. He's been, he's been in the bar room. His life is a mess. He's been divorced three times. Preacher said, you know, I told him years ago, you need to give your life to Christ. I'm tired of repeating the same message too late. I want the people that are here today to realize you are liberated from Christ, and I'll shout it until the day I die. You don't have to be in bondage. Take the victory in Christ. Stop letting the devil destroy the hope that is in your life. And give yourself to Jesus. There is nothing better in your life than to spend every moment you can in the house of God. To spend every moment you can in the Word of God. To spend every moment you can in prayer and serving. There is no greater deed you can do than just to go out and hand out a gospel tract and share your testimony and let people see Christ in you. There's no better joy in your life than when someone comes up to you and says, hey, something's different about you. You're not like everybody else. And you say, yeah. But it's not because of me. It's because of what somebody else has done for me. 
Galatians chapter 2. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Love him back. Ephesians, Philippians 3, 9, And being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. God, do something with me. Help me not to give in to the drawing of the world. Help me not to give in to the lust of the world. Help me to stand for you. See if he doesn't do it. God is wonderful and marvelous and he's full of mercy and grace. And he wants nothing more than for us to turn to him and to claim the power of the word of God. The last verse here, verse 11. But we believe through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. That's what we believe today. You have to receive salvation. You have to recognize it as a gift. You have to receive it as a gift. It's nothing that you do. It's all of what Christ has done for you. And I'm telling you that that grace continues in your life. That you go to God in prayer by grace. That you serve him by grace. That you, that you obey his word by grace. By grace, he straightens up your marital problems. By grace, he straightens up your, your, your anger problems. By grace, he strengthens up your addiction problems. By grace, he helps you with your children. By grace, he helps you with your job and earning a living and having a testimony and doing things for Christ. These are all problems that we all deal with. And all the world deals with them too. There's nothing unique in this world. All the sin is common to man. But the difference for the believer is that by the grace of God, we have the strength to live the life. By God's grace, I plan on being a dad that can help my boys and my daughter and have a testimony for them. I didn't have that. By God's grace, they will. Not because of who I am, but who Christ is. You know, legalism and many other things in our society today that have been redefined to excuse people for lust and compensation to the devil have destroyed homes and lives and people and left them in bondage. I don't want that for our church. I don't want it for anybody we know. I want people to know not that they have to live a certain way to be saved, but if they're saved, they can live. Because Christ said, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And that's what he wants for you. Let's bow our heads this morning. As we go before the Lord, maybe God...